All right. We are live. Cheers, everybody. I'm super excited today. Uh, we had to bust in here real quick because we already started getting into some some good discussions. And, and so we had to get here live for the rest of everybody else to hear. Uh, we got Del Potter on today. Really excited. Um, one of the psychedelic titans out there. Uh, just from the little bit of um, what you had sent, your, your little biography, autobiography, it's going to be one hell of a story uh, or stories, I should say. Um, I'm yeah, excited. Th this may, if Dell's down for it, this may be like a multi part. Uh, we don't have to cover it all in one conversation if you're willing to come back. For sure. But, but, but the first question was simply, I, I said, are you in the Bay Area? And you said, no, I live in Mendocino by the water on 10 acres of land that you bought when? Uh, 1989. And why well, did you buy that land? Well, I mean, the story really is, why did I come to Guadalajara, which is a pretty remote place about uh, three hours to San Francisco on, on the coast? And it was really the result of trying to find a secluded uh, place to be able to grow psychedelic mushrooms. Got it. Now, beforehand, <clears throat> was there already a big renaissance coming in of, of, of the psychedelic mushrooms, per se? Or was that kind of a, a niche area at that time? Was it more so more analogs coming out or how? Was and and where, were you, where, where were you in the Bay Area before then or where were you moving well, I, from? I, I was going to school in Berkeley and okay. I, I uh, <laughs> uh, had this idea. I hatched an idea to help me fund graduate school was to uh, I was actually working among the Mazatec uh, at the time and I became aware that there were uh, psychedelic mushrooms that, you know, was kind of a new thing at the time. You know, LSD had been on the scene for quite some time uh, and had, you know, really transformed things in a, in a big way. But it, the supply was always unpredictable and you, you never quite knew where or when you could get it. Uh, and so when I was in central Mexico working, uh, I had the good fortune to uh, find some particularly beautiful specimens of psilocybe cubensis uh, growing next to the ruins in Palenque, actually walking down from the ruins in Palenque, uh, and uh, decided, you know, basically as a way to underwrite my graduate work was to, you know, it, it, you know, going to graduate school is a form of slavery, really. And it's, it's difficult to manage, and even at that time. Um, so I went ahead and cultured these uh, cubensis mushrooms in a small motel in Mexico uh, and began isolating the cultures with the intent of smuggling them back across the border and figuring out how essentially to cultivate them at scale. And I had kind of an inclination to do this at a fairly commercial scale uh, because I had, you know, as a, having a background in anthropology, I always felt like uh, this would be an incredible way to influence the direction of the culture. Uh, you know, we were just, you know, basically coming out of the Vietnam War. Uh, you know, things were, you know, in upheaval. Uh, the 60s had kind of crashed at that point and it looked like a great opportunity to infuse psychedelics into, into the culture and send, see if it could send things in the right direction. So basically what I did was culture those mushrooms uh, in uh, the motel in Palenque. There's an, quite a stories, a number of stories around that. Uh, you know, at the time uh, in Chiapas, there was an uprising. Uh, the uh, Comandante Marcos, was representing uh, an indigenous uprising. And so there was a major military presence and I had to drive through military checkpoints with these mushrooms uh, in the car. And I had no idea essentially what they would say if they actually found them. And so you had 17 year old guys with machine guns asking me questions about what are you doing here? And 
I, you know, had a fairly good story that I was an anthropologist studying uh, indigenous practice and, you know, uh, interested in the ruins in Palenque. Uh, but having, having said that, you know, it was, it was a pretty frightening experience, uh, you know, going back and forth and just finding the mushrooms was an incredible, you know, task really, because uh, it was the beginning of the rainy season and their appearance was intermittent. And I really was looking all over the place to try to find them. I had a number of failed attempts. I'd get there and they were already dried up and I couldn't take successfully take a culture of them. Uh, and finally, uh, I had the experience of walking down with a guide from uh, the, the temple at Palenque and walking into this, you know, through the jungle, crossing a river, you know, and finally getting to this beautiful open field of uh, some of the most beautiful Jersey cows I'd ever seen in Mexico. And there were all these cow patties with some of the largest specimens of psilocybe cubensis I'd ever seen, variety palenque. And the reason I was kind of looking for variety palenque was uh, that's where Gore, uh, Roger Heim had found samples. There was kind of an underground notion that uh, there was a place there that you know you could you could find and collect them. But they do grow throughout the region, you know, of central Mexico. So I got them into the motel, was managed to isolate them into a pure, pure culture and put them into tubes, uh, test tubes, culture tubes uh, for transport. And I had, uh, I had a friend, he's an older gentleman who was about five foot six. He looked like a leprechaun version of Santa Claus. And he had a big white beard and he would cross the border from Nogales every day so he had this uh, trick uh, coffee uh, thermos that he would take the sleeve out of and I put the culture tubes in there and then we put the sleeve back in so it would look like he could pour coffee out of it. And it was really hard to tell that there was anything in it. So he drove across the border from Nogales with them uh, and now I had them in the United States and the challenge was you know, figure out how to grow them commercially at scale. And, you know, this was uh, around 1978. So not, you know, they hadn't really shown up in, you know, any amount on the scene on the, you know, uh, th there just wasn't anything like that. Now, that's kind of the smack dab in the middle of uh, the war on drugs too, kind of getting started up and rolling. And, and it's a little bit different from the 60s with peace, love and and everybody's, you know, having a good time. This is this is, uh, you know, you're getting a lot of violence, not only from, you know, the United States government, but I liked what you were kind of talking about in, in, in your in your autobiography about the cartel and stuff like that and how you're spending time with this gentleman. And then the next day, you know, you find out, oh, well, he's gone, you know? Well, so. well to frame it really, um, drug manufacture well, at the time was kind of looked at as a revolutionary act. Uh, it's kind of the only way I can describe it. Uh, it didn't have the connotation, some of, some of the, you know, uglier connotation that it came to acquire. Uh, it was considered a way, you know, taking drugs was a way of getting to the edge and pushing the envelope. And uh, drug manufacture was like a high calling at the time, uh, at least among uh, the, the people I, I uh, hung out with. And uh, we felt it was a certain level of responsibility to try to make these uh, drug enterprises uh, happen, you know, and... and that really was the motivation. There was money involved, but uh, the money was was really secondary. And the risk was, as you point out, uh, enormous. Uh, you know, uh, at that time, you know, it was just the drug war was just really ramping up. And uh, basically psychedelics kind of fell into the category uh, similar to, you know, heroin or uh, opiates. Yeah, yeah, it's quite unfortunate on that. Now, um, you said you kind of stumbled across the these mushrooms. Did you already kind of have like a little bit of mycology in your background? Did you kind of go down there with a vision like, okay, um, 
this is what I, I want to do? Or was it more perhaps uh, a, a fate? Well, I was interested in studying how mushrooms were used uh, in ceremony and ritual among the Mazatec. And I was interested in seeing how kind of what might be described as their approach to treating mental health issues or what we might describe as psychotherapy, how their uh, their procedures or, or their uh, practice would uh, inform uh, Western approaches to psychotherapy. And, you know, psych psychedelic drugs and, uh, you know, particularly mushrooms were a huge part of that. Uh, and, you know, at this time, we had already had the uh, 1957 Life magazine article that had Gordon Wassoon and Roger Heim, uh, you know, at, at, perform at a mushroom ceremony. And that, that kind of revealed to the world the importance of this. But I was really interested in seeing how more broadly uh, shamanic practice might inform Western psychotherapy. Now, so you saw early on, I mean, this is decades, decades, decades before anybody else kind of even started thinking about the, the connection between mental health and psychedelics. Um, that's pretty amazing, I, I'd say, just because, I mean, you have a, a, a resurgence of psychedelics now just for that kind of reason, it seems like, is to be able to help. And uh, it kind of had a different stigma back in the day. It was more of like, a, oh, yeah, this is just a perfect way to, you know, just unconform and, and become your own person? Well, my, my research had started really looking at the psychohistory of shamanic practitioners and uh, seeing what commonalities there were across cultures in, in, that psych, in those psychohistories, uh, but also looking at more broadly than just the use of psychedelic compounds, how uh, shamanic practice was different in treating mental health issues than a Western paradigm. Uh, so essentially, you know, we say, you know, if you have a problem, we're going to fix that specific problem and you're okay. And now we're going to send you on your way. Let's say you broke your arm. Uh, now we fixed your arm. We're going to send you on your way. In an indigenous context and in a shamanic practice, uh, it, it's looked at in a much broader way. They want to know, why did you break your arm? What actually preceded it? What is the context for it? Did you have an argument with someone in your social network? Let's let's deal with that problem. Uh, did you fall out of relationship with nature? Or did you break a rule or a taboo that you feel guilty about and it distracted you? Uh, they, they approach things from a much broader context. And I always felt that more broadly that that whole approach would really inform the way we, we conduct psychotherapy, which really was much more narrowly focused on intrapsychic factors and psychology rather than this, this broader picture. Uh, and psychedelic drugs were an, uh, an incredible part of that because uh, what they allowed people to do is, you know, get closer to nature, restore their relationship to community. And, and that's the way they were used. You know, and I, I started out really looking at, you know, ceremony and ritual. And as time went on, I became more and more interested in the phytochemistry of what was actually in shamanic formulations uh, and really finding out that it was far more sophisticated than I ever really imagined. That it takes the, the actual construction of the pharmacology involved, uh, looking at the individual's existential uh, condition, his disease, his or her disease process, uh, and you know, also those elements of the social network and his relationship to community and to the world. That's that's quite amazing. Um, and I, you know, as more and more people are reaching out to psychedelics today to be able to help some of these things uh, that we're faced with, it seems like societal pressures of today are a lot of the causes of, of, of why a lot of us are suffering and having a lot of these uh, mental health episodes or problems, maladaptive coping techniques, however you want to call it, addictions, you know, um, compulsions, all these things. And so from what I was hearing from that, you know, I really liked that they were like, oh, okay, well, why, 
what happened to cause you to have that action to break your arm instead of, okay, you broke your arm. Here's some painkillers. Here's a cast rest. We'll send you to physical therapy afterwards, resume normal life. You know what I mean? Instead of everything that happened before that, um, I think that's rather remarkable. Yeah. You know, when you enter, you know, uh, you know, a ritual or ceremony, it, it, from an indigenous perspective, you're having an encounter with the supernatural and the supernatural is, you know, behind everything. It, it, you know, everything else is kind of a facade for this spirit or this connection uh, that actually exists behind things. So you're actually coming to terms with that. And the ritual and ceremony allows you a multi-step process to engage with the supernatural. And it may not be something actually that you as an average person can face yourself. It's something that needs an intermediary, a shama shamanic guide, someone who is actually skilled in dealing with the supernatural can, and can help you make that connection. Once that connection is made, then it can help to reorder your life and, and resolve issues of uh, you know, disease and health. Yeah, and, and for me, that's kind of how I've had my experiences with psychedelics. And so I've been kind of trying to describe to people why I'm kind of taking pauses in between them, you know, and, and as you evolve as a person, as, as your life evolves, it's I, I, I refer to it as cleaning house. You know, yes, I have to cl clean my physical place because I don't want to see dirty really anything while I'm going through these experiences. But. I don't want that same clutter inside my inside my physical self, inside my spiritual self, you know, and it's not necessary. Yeah, it's a recreational tool, but it is really a, a tool for me these days. And it's a way of being able to be introspective and being able to just stay, take a step back and see everything instead of reacting to everything. And, and so uh, they I'm, I'm excited to see where this is going. Um, did you think like back in the day when, when you're running across borders and, and everything like that, did you think that it would take this long for the government to catch on or were you like, they're always going to just kind of double down on what they're saying? It was a completely different world back then. Uh, you know, the police presence and level of authority was so much greater, uh, you know, there was no room for acceptance of any of this. Uh, and those of us who had an alternative view really felt like we were operating completely outside of what was conventional social order. Uh, we were aware of that. We had a vision. We knew that, you know, there was value there. But, uh, you know, the dominant cultural, uh, you know, vision was that we were, uh, we were outlaws. We were uh, we were people who, uh, you know, should be shunned and feel the full force of uh, you know, the justice system. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to describe the extent to which that was true compared to the way it was now. There was no sense, you know, that uh, these compounds had any value for treatment of mental health or other issues. Uh, it was simply that they were drugs and uh, it was viewed as, you know, they're a form of escapism. Uh, you know, you, you were supposed to get back to work, basically. Were, were there, um, you know, I, I feel like human history, there are kind of like breaks and then we kind of lose things. So were, were there people that you met in your anthropological studies in Mexico who kind of never, never broke that continuation of kind of the practices of the past. Cause I feel like in modern society, it's like the industrial revolution. People are suddenly moved from the farms into London or something. And then like the next generation kind of has lost everything their grandparents knew about kind of the world. Right. And so, can you talk about some of the people you met along the way and at who, who, who are still linearly connected to their past? Well, I mean, you know, in Mexico, uh, definitely, uh, you know, there is an unbroken tradition and legacy that goes back, you know, thousands of years, literally. 
uh, you know, to Mayan culture, uh, you know, there is a sort of a seamless uh, legacy there. Uh, and it was represented by uh, a, a lot of the curanderos that, that I met uh, while I was in Mexico. Uh, you know, and I always felt like, uh, you know, this model or the way they, they worked with people and the way they looked at the world could really inform our, our way of looking at the world, which uh, was almost an opposite kind of thing. So some of the people that I met, uh, you know, were interesting kind of Don Juan type characters who uh, had a sense of mastery over their lives and, and a sense of confidence about, uh, you know, how, what, what was valuable and what wasn't, regardless of what, uh, you know, society uh, was saying. So, you know, the Mayans had suffered a great deal of, uh, you know, harm and difficulty uh, with, uh, you know, when, when the Spanish con conquered their territory, there was an, an attempt to try and integrate, you know, Mayan culture with Spanish culture and Christianity. And they were quite willing to accept that veneer in order to continue to operate with, you know, legacy that they really recognize as going back thousands of years. Yeah, I mean, you know, you always hear history repeats itself, you know, and with the resurgence of today, um, it's great. What I've kind of seen, and, and I hear kind of, I, I get these dings when, when I've been kind of looking over some of the stuff you, you've written and, and works, and it kind of comes back to like cultivation, you know what I mean? You were getting genetics down to, to the guys down in Mexico, so they don't have to, you know, so they could actually grow some good stuff. Uh, now is with the mushrooms, and then I'm sure it, it, it spilled over into other compounds, you know, like like surgicides and such. Um, what, how, how did that? Was that always kind of a hobby of yours, or were you just like, hold on, there's a big disruption in the in the supply chain. Let's knock that out. Yeah, that's an interesting point because you know it always came down to the supply chain. You know, how can we? I mean, here we have this experience. How can we promote it? How can we? get it into the hands of other people who have an experience, you know, talking about it's one thing, but actually experiencing it is transformative. So it always came down to a question of the supply chain. Uh, and always, how do we do this really at commercial scale? Uh, you know, it's one thing to have a backyard amount, and then you're, you're basically turning on a few friends, but uh, being able to actually influence society or do this on a much bigger scale was always, you know, the kind of the goal. Uh, and, uh, you know, that kind of is something that runs through everything that I've done, you know, from mushrooms to cannabis to manufacture of LSD uh, and, you know, looking at shorter acting tryptamines. I always thought, you know, the, the experience speaks for itself. All we have to do is get this experience in the hands of people and, uh, social change will take place from there. Now, of course, that was naive in many ways. As a young person, that's kind of the way I looked at things. You know, I have a, a slightly different viewpoint now, but, uh, you know, we, again, we're coming out of the 60s. Uh, there was a tremendous social movement, you know, coalesced around the Vietnam War, politics. I mean, we really thought that uh, we were on the verge of kind of revolution both politically and socially. And at some point, you know, I kind of turned around and there was nobody behind me. <laughs> and it was just, you know, a few of us who were, you know, more committed or still left that were kind of carrying the torch. What, when did LSD kind of first come across your radar in the Berkeley area? Like what? Um, well, kind of before years? that, you know, I grew up in Southern California and uh, my first experience with LSD was in high school. Uh, you know, I was uh, 15, 15 and a half, 16. Uh, and, you know, a lot of my friends were talking about it. Uh, it was part of the 
kind of the zeitgeist at the time. Uh, I was kind of loosely involved with people who knew uh, the groups around the Grateful Dead, the Merry Pranksters. Uh, you know, we were all aware of Timothy Leary and uh, just from that perspective, I was interested in trying this trying this drug and I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, so I had my first experience when I was about 15 and a half. Uh, and it was, I was fortunate. It was uh, Owsley manufactured uh, purple double dome, uh, which was, you know, somewhere between 250 and 300 micrograms of some of the finest manufactured LSD. And, and people may not realize, and this is another reason you know, we were always trying to operate at commercial scale was quality control. Uh, people may not realize that uh, what passes for LSD on the street often is a soup of isomers of many, you know, variants of LSD and not really the pure LSD 25 experience uh, that was put forward by Stan, you know, put people access through Sandoz. Uh, and you know, one of the people who really got LSD manufacturing right was Stanley Owsley. There is no question uh, that he uh, knew exactly what he was doing. And it, it's uh, it's a lot of lab technique. There's a tremendous amount of really precise lab technique involved, especially in an underground context. And it's easy for it to go wrong and it's easy for it to not be quite right. Uh, but he got it right and i was fortunate to be able to have access to that and that experience absolutely changed the direction of my life i didn't expect it to but it did now what happens if it goes wrong you know that's that's certainly a concern you know and as it enters the culture in a much broader scale you know that that's definitely a concern i i think there is some you know balance that needs to be achieved between just having it available through clinical gatekeepers, which make it very kind of inaccessible and difficult and expensive, and that it just take place strictly in a medical context and having too uh, broad a, a, an acceptance where, where people who maybe should exercise caution don't and uh, get into trouble because that can happen. Uh, and it's certainly a concern. So I think there's a balance a balanced perspective that we can find that allows for it. You know, I'm all for let's use this among friends. Let's use this in community. Let's not necessarily force this into a therapeutic con uh, context, but uh, you know, by all means, a therapeutic context in many cases. But uh, I think that in the future, we'll see, we'll see psychedelics in a take home paradigm where we'll be, we won't be, only taking them in clinics. We'll be taking them at home, uh, you know, maybe a low dose situation where we can, you know, use it as a substitute for alcohol. Uh, have, you, maybe. have you heard of Mind Bloom? Sure. Okay. Yeah. I, I just recently stumbled across them. Um, I thought that was unique that they're offering the at home therapy and they're giving you yeah. some pretty extensive tools from what I see. They're not just be like, Hey, here you go. Go have Go have some fun, kiddo. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, which can be therapeutic all within its own. You know what I mean? But by setting that that intention and, and kind of really understanding what you're doing, I feel that's a step closer to what you were descri describing earlier with the shamanic practitioners, right? They're kind of getting to the core of the issue instead of like here in Chicago, uh, they have ketamine treatment centers all over the place, but most of them are just dope holes. You know what I mean? You go pay a couple hundred bucks, you sit down, they give you a warm blanket and you get an IV and just trip out for a while. Right. And that can be therapeutic for somebody who's having a crazy chaotic lifestyle. Right. And they just need mm -hmm. that kind of reconnection. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, that, yeah. that kind of just triggered that when you were saying that at home uh, instead of at a clinical setting. I, I just think that these compounds can provide so much more uh, than simply dealing with medical indications and mental health issues. I believe that they can be a way of just sorting things out for yourself personally, uh, a way of getting closer to nature, uh, you know, in the, in this future paradigm where, where you have a take home medication, it may be a way for couples to sort out couples issues or, 
you know, it, 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 it's a much, it has a much greater benefit than simply treating mental health issues. I, I, you know, that's, I think that holds a lot of weight. And um, so I, I had up here, I meant to put it into a banner, but I didn't. It said you were having dinner with um, Alexander Shul Shulgin. Uh-huh. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, the underground chemistry, ha I'm, a lot of it's still underground for most people that are trying to, you know, disrupt that supply chain per se, you know, cause even out in uh, Canada that where a lot of these things are, are quote unquote legal, you know, uh, some of the stuff they're getting isn't necessarily quality controlled that well. Um, do you see uh, home cultivation and home synthesization of these, these compounds? Do you see that a, a thing in, in the future for, United States, or do you think that might be something to come? Is it going to be more of a power hold, or? Well, certainly with botanicals, I, I believe you know we have the right to cultivate uh, psychedelic botanicals and be able to again use them at home, and it is certainly one way of controlling quality. Uh, you know, there, there, you know, synthetic chemistry is a difficult proposition in many cases for many people precursors are restricted uh you know you have to know what you're doing uh you know it's it's a difficult proposition for most people whereas botanicals give a much uh broader access to people uh and still have a really high level of quality uh you know and and certainly that is the direction we're kind of headed you know home cultivation of mushrooms has really gone gone you know crazy everybody uh, has figured out that you can grow these things at home easily. And the same is true of cannabis. The same is true of, you know, many other psychedelic botanicals. So I think it's a way of uh, dealing with that quality control issue, being able to do it at home. Now, with that, do you see a difference between, say, analogs versus the actual the actual substance, you know, like they're, they're like, uh, let's say with like the frog, right? Um, yeah. Things of that nature. Uh, they say it kind of takes away the spiritual aspect of it. Or yeah. And so that really enters into it in a way I, I'm not, a, uh, you know, a great believer in, you know, the spirit is entirely contained in uh, the botanical product, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm sure many of the indigenous practitioners that I've engaged with would probably disagree with me. Uh, they, they would suggest that, you know, it's inherent in, in, in the botanical product. Uh, myself personally, I, I think there may be some benefits in terms of environmental impact uh, using synthetics. You brought up the toad, you know, obviously we don't want to see uh, uh, Alvarius toads eliminated from the environment for people wanting to uh, smoke their venom. Not only that, there's another issue. Uh, bufotenine has a, a level of toxicity. Now, people may disagree with me, but uh, I think that in some cases, it's, it's a little more neurotoxic. Uh, and oftentimes, you run into this with botanicals. And there may be some value added in being able to purify and create a synthetic compound uh, that is less neurotoxic. And I think people may be advised uh, to kind of look more closely at 5-MeO-DMT as opposed to bufotenine in that case. And that is instructive uh, in a number of cases. You know, there there is some value in the pharmaceutical model. Certainly, you know, we have problems with uh, pharmaceutical enterprise in this com country in, as it's embedded in capitalism. Uh, but the pharmaceutical project, that is to make uh, compounds that are more targeted, that have more safety, that have less adverse effects, I think is a really worthwhile project. You know, uh, uh, undeniably, vaccines and uh, antibiotics have saved millions of lives. Uh, how we deliver them, you know, and how we distribute them, that's another subject. But, 
you know, I, I think there's tremendous value uh, in that project and trying to make drugs that are better and finding ways to deliver them that are more, uh, that are safer, less adverse effects, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think that kind of goes in hand with a lot of things, the, the sourcing of it, how we're taking it from the environment. Um, because I mean, Iboga, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day about that. Um, such a wonderful tool, right? But the way that they're obtaining that tool is uh, very selfish and, and it's and it's detrimental and, and it hurts more than the life that it might be saving, you know, uh, for the person administering it. Right. And there are some cardiac issues associated with Ibogaine that, you know, may be uh, a concern, uh, you know, and, and certainly it has to be weighed against, uh, you know, the benefits that Ibogaine can provide. But I, I don't think it's, a, uh, you know, misguided to, you know, really look for an alternative to Ibogaine that maybe has less cardiac issues and is less impactful to the environment. Absolutely. And then um, going back, I, I have so much to ask, honestly. <laughs> but uh, Yeah, in my head, I'm like, we could go this way, we could go yeah. that way, we could go that <laughs> way, we could go that way. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think this would kind of be kind of interesting and, and, and a kind of fun switch of pace for a second. Um, obviously with borders and everything like that, you know, uh, the transportation of ways of things getting here or from there to here, vice versa, was awfully unique. Do you have any kind of rather unique uh, stories of, of, of getting stuff across or, or somebody else that might have used a, a rather unique <laughs> technique? Best well, practices have... in trafficking. <laughs> I have quite a few. We, we had some characters uh, back in the day and people who, uh, again, uh, it became almost like uh, a lifestyle in some ways, you know, a, a level of achievement if you could pull it off. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I mentioned in some of the stuff that I sent you guys, uh, a couple of characters that I thought were quite interesting. One was uh, George, who uh, was the guy who looked like the leprechaun version of Santa Claus. He was an older gentleman had been through World War II and was, uh, he told the story of uh, meeting his wife in Germany and being a cook for the Seventh Army uh, at the Battle of the Bulge. And he fell in love and he wanted to take his wife home. So he decided to smuggle her in these giant cooking pots that they used to feed the entire army. Uh, and he had this, you know, game of, of, you know, putting her in different cooking pots, depending upon which inspection and which general uh, happened to be showing up at the time. He managed to put her in one of those cooking pots and put her on a uh, steam liner back to the U.S. She jumped overboard in the East River in New York, and he went out in a rowboat and picked her up. So uh, smuggling was a practiced art for George since World War II. And uh, he had a kind of disarming presence. I mean, ever suspect that he was a smuggler. You never would. Um, but, you know, a typical uh, approach that he might use, some of it was, you know, pretty seat of the pants. Other, you might look at it from a perspective of, you know, this is ingenious. Uh, he dressed up as a... Um, a Catholic priest, and uh, had a stack of Bibles that he he put in, he twined together with string, and he hollowed out the center of those Bibles and filled them with cocaine uh, from Colombia. So he had to go to Colombia, you know, find the cocaine, set this all up somewhere, and flew right into customs dressed as a uh, a Catholic priest with a bundle of Bibles filled with Coke. And as he was sitting, you know, he had them on the counter. He noticed one of them was kind of leaking product out under the counter. He had to brush it off, but somehow George always made it through. I don't know exactly how to explain it, 
uh, that was uh, one one thing that you know I, George was an impressive character. He was the only person to ever escape from Terminal Island Federal Prison in Washington in a very elaborate scheme uh, that involved, you know, tunneling and falling, you know, going down uh, drain pipes and ma manufacturing a key to get through a particular lock. But he was an ingenious character and ended up being the person that I picked to run our warehouse uh, receiving cannabis across the border. Uh, when we were smuggling it in Mexico, but he was one character. I'll give you another one was, uh, his partner. Uh, well, let's just say his name was John. Uh, he, uh, was in special ops in the Vietnam war and had done all kinds of unspeakable things. Uh, but, uh, he had this method of, of importing cocaine where they would, they had found out that, uh, a small amount under half an ounce could actually be sent in a letter from Colombia and avoid custom scrutiny. So they had people sending millions of letters to post office boxes up and down uh, the Bay Area. Uh, he would have these circuits that would run from, uh, you know, Santa Rosa to, uh, you know, up north to back down to Monterey, Carmel, and every time he picked up a letter, it was another half ounce of cocaine. Uh, and then he would aggregate it. <laughs> so, you know, that that's a couple. Uh, I'll, I'll give you one more that I always thought was clever. Uh, and this really is taking the lid off uh, things by telling you this, but, you know, it's, it's way down the line at and, this point. And by the way, there's probably a lot of <laughs> note taking right now. Yeah. Um, we had these friends who had a customs broker, uh, and, uh, the customs broker actually is the one who calls customs to come look at a, uh, you know, to come inspect uh, a shipment. So he's in actually a, a pretty good position as far as smuggling is concerned. Uh, my, the group I knew of would, have suitcases that they lined with cocaine and filled with antiques and uh, they would ship it to him and he would receive it as a cuffsmith broker they would then swap it with an exact duplicate uh prior to him calling customs and uh that was enormously successful actually ended up being a way that uh actual full container loads of Thai weed from Thailand were smuggled into the country. A container load uh, would arrive, you know, half filled with uh, bundled packages of Thai weed. And, uh, you know, he, he would delay calling customs until they showed up with an, a cargo container that was exactly the same as that one. They'd haul it away. I mean, people got bolder and bolder, I think, as time went on. And the success of the scheme uh, proved you know, uh, effective. Uh, but then there was basically the standard methods that the cartel employed. And that was uh, a system of crossers who were very sensitive to movements of the border patrol and interdiction efforts. And they would wait for just the right moment and scoot across the border in cars or trucks uh, and, uh, you know, reassemble it in a warehouse on the other side. And that was really the most common uh, approach. The crossers had uh, a lot of intel on what uh, Border Patrol was doing. So they had the opportunity to really uh, plan and, and uh, you know, exercise a lot of caution before, uh, before doing it. So, you know, that, that was more or less the standard method. Yeah, I, and, um... You know, it as time goes on, um, some things can be muddied, it, it seems, you know, and people oftentimes forget that some of these these medicines that that we're using piggybacked on some maybe harder substances, you know what I mean? Uh, and some more uh, what would be deadly. But what's lost is, you know. These substances that we widely abuse today um, in more advanced societies aren't necessarily abused 
and where they're kind of uh, produced and, and naturally occurring, you know, um, they're almost, they're, they're held more in a reverence uh, and, and they're used more medicinally. Uh, do you think moving forward that we're, I mean, you see the, the, uh, the feds interest now in, in cocaine and stuff like that, now that they're able to, to get different forms of it and such, do you see, do you see that gap being broken? Well, I, I think, you know, things have changed dramatically, you know, I mean, I think a lot of uh, the economic proposition for the cartels involves opiates, fentanyl, you know, methamphetamine, the really hard stuff. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm sure, you know, cocaine is still, uh, you know, kind of a, an attractive prospect to them. But in general, I think, uh, you know, they have an established clientele that deals in opiates. And that has become the kind of the main commerce, uh, you know, and it wasn't always that way. Uh, most of the smuggling routes and most of the supply chain aspects really revolved around cannabis. Uh, cannabis was kind of the, you know, the first, uh, you know, the first product to really enjoy a lot of uh, smuggling effort. Uh, those same routes then eventually became, you know, part of cocaine trafficking. And as you, you know, it's, it's a good point that you bring up that, uh, you know, these compounds are not used the same way in the places from which they come. You know, cocaine is uh, not used extensively, uh, you know, at that time. I mean, now, of course, everything's been disrupted. But at that time, there were a lot of restrictions on who would use it and how it would be used. Uh, and, you know, we had some some basically we had some rules in place. Uh, but uh, now I think all of that's been corrupted and we have no rules whatsoever. Uh, and what's resulted is a really bloody enterprise. Uh, you know, back then, uh, things weren't carried out with malice as much as with a matter of honor. Uh, it, it was much more oriented along those lines. But again, cannabis was the, the primary product uh, that kind of opened the smuggling routes up from Mexico. Absolutely. I think that uh, some of the stigmas that carry with a lot of uh, illicit substances um, are being broken down uh, just because of the misinformation of the war on drugs and such. And they're seeing that it was more so a ploy in power. And I mean, uh, myself, I was never interested in cocaine or any of the harder drugs. I, I was just, you know, my interest was around psychedelics and cannabis and, you know, by necessity, you end up, you know, there's a certain intersection there uh, unavoidably uh, when those same roots are used for uh, cocaine and other substances. I never really ran in that at that at the time I was operating. I didn't really run into uh, a lot of uh, opiates or, uh, you know, what we see now, methamphetamine. It was, you know, uh, mostly cannabis with a smattering of cocaine. Uh, and you know, that was fine with me. I was much more interested in, you know, I, I mean, uh, at one point, uh, uh, head of the cartel gave me like, I was in a warehouse where they had 55 gallon drums filled with cocaine stacked four high for about as far as I could see. And, uh, he was so pleased with, uh, you know, some of the other things I was doing. He opened the top of one of these, reached in and grabbed a huge scoop of the cocaine, put it in a plastic bag and said, here, I want to give you this as a present. I'm uh, thinking to myself, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> you know, uh, what do you, you know, addict all my friends and, you know, uh, do it that, you know, what, what do I do with this? You know? Uh, and, uh, at that time, now I'm actually in Juarez with this and then I have to get across the border, get across the border. Now I'm in El Paso with this huge bag of cocaine. And I'm like, well, you know, I just want to throw this away, but I, it seems so incredibly wasteful. Uh, so I ended up just throwing it in my suitcase and flying out with it. Uh, which I know that sounds extremely odd at this time, but in those days, uh, you know, it was doable. It was way, way pre 9-11. 
with, with all the time you were kind of so it seems like a lot of your geographic travel was kind of through central and south america is that accurate yeah and yeah. uh the the cannabis you were smoking along the way can you kind of talk about stuff stuff you well actually going back to 15 year old dell in socal <laughs> Oh my gosh! What, what what was your crew smoking back then? And then, kind of, what what were you introduced to in in kind of Central and South America? Well, as, as we've been discussing, I've always been concerned with supply chain, and I ended up kind of being, you know, the distributor for my high school. Uh, you know, I went to a pretty exclusive uh, high school. It was a boarding school, uh, kind of modeled after Oxford. Uh, a lot of some of the richest kids in the country went there, some representing some of the richest families in America. And, you know, for example, uh, one of the uh, one of the people I went to school was was the Prince of Thailand. And uh, he would bring Thai weed, Thai sticks in a diplomatic pouch. Uh, uh, and I actually became kind of a distributor. And the quality of the cannabis was extremely poor. You know, it was like uh, by today's standards, it was unrecognizable almost as cannabis. Uh, you know, there was a few small, you know, flowers in there kind of, but it was a mix of uh, pressed usually into a brick, uh, you know, that you would have to kind of steam apart. There was a lot of ritual involved in that. And there were seeds and stems and just everything was kind of packed into these bricks but we were grateful even to have that because that's basically you know what we had and we were always uh you know trying to save the seeds for our own little cultivation projects in in uh domestically in the u.s which was difficult to uh to nearly impossible to carry off because of how obvious and intentional it would seem to everyone else so you know, we go through a pretty elaborate ritual. I remember the, the first kilo that I got was from uh, Newport uh, Beach, no, Laguna Beach. And uh, there was a Taco Bell there with a guy who wore uh, an old army coat. And uh, in, if he opened up the army coat, he had kilos of uh, Mexican pot inside there. Uh, and so I was able to get my first kilo from him, took it back broke it up, took the stems and the seeds out of it and put it into baggies uh, and sold it for, I think, $10 a, a, a baggie. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was sort of the state of the art at the time. Uh, very poor quality, frequently moldy. You know, we had no idea, you know, what pesticides, what mold, anything. And we just did our best to try and clean and glean uh, the best we could from what we got. We lost uh, DP. So, shoot, we have a Panama Red enthusiast uh, <laughs> who actually has sent me many Panama Red seeds that I've been getting out to people. A, a lot of kind of what I enjoy doing is getting kind of more heirloom land racy stuff from around the world just freely out to everyone and then they can kind of experience it explore it do what they want with it uh it was over time that it began to differentiate and i remember the first you know time was i i went to you know pick up a kilo usually again in laguna beach a lot of smuggling activity took place around laguna beach I think largely because of the uh, Brotherhood of Eternal Love, who was kind of operating in that area at the time. They had a, uh, um, a head shop called Mystic Arts, uh, which was pretty famous uh, place. And that was really a place where you could go to find you know, cannabis. And I remember the first time I had a differentiated uh, you know pound and it was uh it had actual flour in it as opposed to just leaf stick stem just a big mess and you know it was it was characterized to me as super weed here you go we've got some super weed and 
I think that was graduation night in 1970. I distributed it to my classmates and we went to Disneyland. But it was it wasn't it wasn't long after that that we began to see some regional differentiation. Uh, Mishwakan, you know, was uh, you know prominent. We began to see you know a higher quality coming out of Mishwakan. Uh, you know, certain regional Sinaloa varieties. Uh, uh, you know, Acapulco Gold. We saw it like a few times, but it was extremely rare. All these regional varieties were extremely rare. And then there was a process whereby as people began to work at scale, uh, there was a homogenization of all of it into, uh, you know, kind of one variety uh, that was, was quite good, you know, uh, by those standards, uh, but it was really represented uh, in as a Michoacan type, uh, a very limey, uh, you know, light green product. Now, were you able to get genetics down there and get uh, down in Mexico and actually get some new genetics going down there? Yeah, um, that was, you know, the business proposition that, you know, I kind of put forward. Uh, this was long after uh, mushrooms. Okay. Uh, what, what happened really was that, you know, I, I distributed, figured out how to grow mushrooms commercially at scale and uh, grew thousands and thousands of pounds, which I distributed, you know, all over the country. And the thought was that we were going to see a tremendous change in uh, society. But what really happened, and that's the naivety of the situation, uh, what really happened was Ronald Reagan became president. And, uh, you know, uh, no one was interested in psychedelics at that time, <laughs> suddenly. And uh, so we, we, we found ourselves, you know, no one's interested in psychedelics. But I had made so many interesting connections. I still was kind of entrepreneurial and wanted to do something with cannabis. So I had this idea. What was new at the time were uh, indica genetics uh, in Mendocino. And, you know, we had small, uh, you know, enterprise that was like, uh, you know, very small scale patches uh, and very high quality uh, indica uh, and so I had, you know, the idea of just, taking... Just, just, just quickly, because mm -hmm. semantics and nomenclature, I think, are important in making sure everybody, when they hear a word, they're thinking the same thing. Are you talking Afghani kind of leaning? like? Yeah, Afghani, okay. I would say uh, the, the model for it would be skunk number one, uh, the original skunk number one, uh, if you're familiar with that. It, it really large indica buds, really strong, uh, you know, really permeating terpene skunk quality to it, uh, which was dramatically different than uh, most of what was around at that time. And, you know, people were very excited by it. So my pro business proposition was to get clones and seeds of that to, uh, to basically to some area where I could actually cultivate it on a commercial scale under, under protection. And so that business proposition took me way into Mexico, uh, way into cartel organizations. The other part of it was that I had met, you know, through distribution of mushrooms, uh, somebody uh, in Texas who lived in Juarez on the border. He's still a very good friend of mine uh, who uh, had made, a, you know, considerable uh, enterprise out of uh, smuggling Mexican uh, pot across the border, cannabis across the border, and distributing it in, in Southern California. Uh, he actually had the connections uh, to the early cartel organizations uh, that were starting to emerge uh, at that time. And it was through him that I was introduced to, uh, you know, young leaders of the cartel. And again, it wasn't the bloody enterprise that it became. Uh, it was much more uh, just about uh, cannabis and nothing else, really. Uh, and so that business proposition, as I said, took me way into Mexico and ended up meeting uh, 
some of the heads of the cartels uh, who basically were foundational figures who developed, for example, Felix Gallardo, who developed the plaza system of handing off uh, a, uh, a shipment from one municipal, municipal region to the next and each organization in each one of those municipal regions would take responsibility as it moved closer and closer to the border. The Juarez group was one of the most important because they were responsible for actually getting it across the border and into the United States. I, I just flashed on the screen uh, Bud, who's uh, probably age uh and has has smoked a joint or two back in the day and continues <laughs> yeah i remember those spears they were uh you know that was certainly an attractive uh an attractive product um you know we had always the idea of the, of, of hybridizing some of the indica genetics with the sativa genetics that were down there which was necessary because uh you know the time the photo period was equatorial more or less and it was really difficult to get in pure indica strains to actually grow to any size before they would start to flower so uh we were always interested in hybridizing as much as we could in order to create a product that would actually grow in mexico that's interesting uh there is a as <clears throat> it's from mike do you think there is a now there is a place and in interest in some land races from crimea peninsula and south eu land races to bring the usa so crimea i think more of uh auto flowering we actually have some um mike maybe you can elaborate if you're because because that's what i think of when i think of the crimean peninsula uh my, I mean, from what I see, people are definitely interested in exploring for, for a variety of reasons, different kind of building block genetics, right? For medical reasons, for effect reasons, for trying to find stuff from the past and starting kind of where that stuff eventually, you know, came from. Uh, but what, what are your thoughts on? My thoughts would be, you know, that is ultimately kind of one of the source regions for cannabis in general. And, uh, you know, I'm uh, incredibly interested in, in land race varieties. That is really how we get and obtain uh, unique genetic diversity. Uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, in the original form, you know, they, they have to be worked with to, to make them actually, you know, any kind of productive uh, quality, but, you know, inherent in them are, unique terpene profiles, unique psychoactive profiles that you just can't get anywhere else. And, and I, myself, I kind of feel like the further you go back, you know, the better, uh, actually, uh, to get things that are completely, you know, unaffected by, uh, many of the strains that we have not many of the varieties that we have now, you know, there's tremendous potential for what's in Africa, what's in Crimea, what's in the Caucasus region, uh, you know, all of those, I think, represent a tremendous opportunity. I think uh, the further we move away from just trying to find that THC percentage and get back to the overall cannabinoid um, percentages, we'll be able to get what everybody considers the entourage effect. But, you know, everything kind of working in unison. Yeah, you know, I, I think kind of what happened essentially with the land race, unique land race uh, uh, varieties in Mexico was just them trying to scale up to meet demand from the United States. Uh, you, you know, we had this homogenization is like all the, this attempt to acquire as many seeds as possible. And I think it kind of started with uh, Rafael Caro Quintero, who was kind of the originator of Sensamia, who figured out, you know, we have to separate males from females. And uh, between he, he uh, between him and Felix Gallardo, uh, they set up an operation in, in Michoacan that was, 
I, it, the name of the place was Rancho Buffalo. Uh, and uh, it's depicted, I think, in Narcos, Mexico. Uh, vast, you know, thousands of hectares. Uh, it was at that point where, you know, varieties started to get diluted and we saw this homogenization. Uh, prior to that, there was a lot of regionality. Not to... it, j, j, it's interesting because it seems like they were dealing with the same stuff that kind of modern, let's say, California commercial operators deal with, right? Like <laughs> it needs to yield. It needs to finish fast. I need to keep, you know, get a couple turns for, you know, what, whatever those those industrial criteria are for a scale of operation kind of dictated the genetic selection. Yeah. Yeah, precisely. Uh, you know, at first it was, let's, you know, what are, you know, what are the demands of scale? What, what absolutely has to occur, occur, occur for us to be able to work at, at these kinds of volumes? And then gradually, uh, you know, the notion of the turnover, the, uh, you know, how we veg, how we, how we flower, all of that started to become a consideration very much similar to uh, what happened later, uh, you know, in cannabis. And that's, uh, I guess, the a raid about to happen on Rancho Buffalo. Yeah, uh, what happened, you know, there was a, uh, a DEA agent, Kiki Camarena, uh, Enrique Camarena, who infiltrated uh, the operation at Rancho Buffalo and kind of brought down the Mexican authorities on it. Uh, it was such an incredible scale that, you know, Mexican authorities basically were paid off uh, at that point. I mean, all the way up to the army. And when it became so obvious and difficult to avoid, uh, you know, that it was operating uh, and, and U.S. intervention exposed it, uh, you know, that's when really things began to go south. Uh, both Felix Gallardo and Rafael Caro Quintero became hunted individuals. They struck back and killed Kiki Camarena. Uh, Mexico said, look, you know, we're not going to allow DEA agents to work in Mexico anymore. We don't, you know, they're more disruptive than they, they provide benefit. And maybe you should look on the demand side rather than on the production side. Like why, uh, you know, why is there so much demand for this product in the United States? And all of that, you know, became really super disruptive. Uh, so what is the reason for such a high demand of such a, such a detrimental substances at some points for some of these things on some of the harder things, maybe not cannabis and, uh, and things like that. But, um, you know, we, uh, the more developed countries we are, it seems, has the more um, kind of uh, trivial problems in the grander scheme of things, it would seem. You know, um, substance addiction is it, pretty trivial when you think about the hunters and gatherers uh, and how they lived back then. They didn't have time for that shit, <laughs> you know. Right. Um, you know, the fact is that what we do is we create with these economies of scale, we create, you know, industries, supply chains, and, you know, people come to depend on them, you know, suddenly their lifestyle is elevated, uh, you know, whereas previously they have, they're operating a subsistence level. Now suddenly they, they can begin to pay the bills. So when U.S. law enforcement disrupts it, it has a ripple effect down through the supply chain and disrupts uh, you know, everybody being able to uh, make a subsistence living. Uh, and uh, they react really strongly as anyone would when, uh, when one's uh, livelihood is threatened. Uh, and, you know, it, it has a much greater significance because so much of the supply chain is based for in Mexico than it does in the United States. I, I'm pretty sure it'd be more terrifying getting in trouble with a uh, 
with the cartel than the, the government. Yeah, you know, uh, certainly, uh, you know, the, the cartel of today, I think, has a pretty extensive reach. Uh, back then, uh, you know, when I was operating in the area, uh, cartel organizations were just kind of starting out and they had considerable uh, political and social influence in Mexico and were smart enough to basically pay off everyone all the way up the line, including government officials. Uh, but, you know, not so, you know, today I think their reach is, you know, it's more like a mafia style organization. They, they operate completely independent of the government at this point. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty wild. I've heard uh, people that have lived down in, in the areas of cartel ran, areas and, and it, it, you know um a lot of people don't hear about some of the positive things like the the schools that they build and and uh, the hospitals and doctors and clinics and libraries um you know uh but it's just the way that it's instilled you know? everything is always more nuanced than you know we want to believe you know that that you know it's not simply uh you know uh, vendettas and revenge and you know uh, that kind of uh, activity. It's also a lot of, uh, you know, beneficial so social effort that they put into communities. Uh, it's always more nuanced than, than just simply straightforward. Uh, you know, they're killing people. For sure. Um, to kind of switch gears a little bit, um, DMT, when did that kind of get on the scene? Um, and what are the clinical... Uh, implications for this since it is such a shorter acting it's not a uh you know it, it's not like getting hit by a bus after taking you know 14 grams of mushrooms and a couple tabs you know like that can be an awful just to get to that that singularity stage that that a uh, dmt experience can can offer you kind of like that yeah uh my first exposure to DMT and 5-methyoxy DMT was in the Amazon with the Yanomami people in Brazil. And, what time uh, frame is this? This was like in 1979, 80. Uh, and my experience there was um, they had a botanical preparation that they would mix with ash, anodanthera, peregrina, seeds, uh, you know, compounds that were really rich in both DMT and 5-methyoxy DMT. And they would create kind of like a bolus and they had an instrument that they would generally use for uh, hunting birds. Uh, it was like a long blow gun. And you, it, it's a two person process. You have to put it in your nose and someone blows it up your nose. And by the time it hits your nose, first of all, you're you know, it's burning and you, you can't even see straight. But uh, by the time it hits your nose, you're higher than you've ever even imagined that you could possibly be. Uh, and, you know, it's like going to the top of an elevator and just being shot out the ceiling or shot out of a cannon. For me, uh, you know, I was under the trees and I remember looking up and seeing foreground and background absolutely changing places. Like, everything that was in the foreground receded into the background. Everything that was in the background came forward. And that was also everything that was in my unconscious suddenly came forward. Uh, and uh, it was right there. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was an overwhelming experience. And then uh, in 15 minutes or so, the effects had started to subside. In half an hour, they had pretty much just subsided. And then uh, in about an hour, I was pretty much on the ground. Everything was a little sparkly, but uh, I was I was completely back. So that was my first experience with it. And uh, I was amazed at the short duration and immediately saw that, you know, the way the place it had in Yanomami society was they just basically they do it every day, uh, you know, maybe twice a day. <laughs> Uh, and it, it's an evocation, almost like, what do we do uh, to, you know, take up time between going hunting or going 
to cultivate or doing stuff like that, uh, you know, essentially out of boredom. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it can lead to some difficult times because everybody is kind of uh, under its influence. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people are under the influence a, a lot of the time. So I immediately began to see, though, that the short duration had a tremendous benefit that uh, being able to go in and out of an experience. And, but I always thought that the intensity of the early onset was problematic. And, you know, to this day, one of the things I, I work on is trying to moderate that intense, on, hypertensive onset to make it a, a more moderate experience. But I do believe there's a tremendous benefit to both 5-MeO and DMT. And, you know, as we see, there's just a recent study that came out uh, from Small Pharma, a uh, small study, but really, I think, instructive in that they had a 57% success rate with uh, major depressive disorder uh, using DMT. And uh, so I think there's a lot of benefit for people who don't want to be in for the long experience, who, uh, you know, you know, I think maybe ultimately it may be more accessible for that reason, uh, as well as the fact that there is tremendous neuroplasticity uh, associated with it. Uh, but we haven't actually demonstrated how that benefits people clinically. It's it's more the nature of the transformative experience that really I think has the therapeutic value. But I think ultimately what we'd like to see is crafting it in such a way that um, it's happen. really it's yeah. really accessible to people with a really moderated onset. That's amazing um, that they do it like every day. I mean, I just yeah. think of like, you know, people here who think they're like drug tough guys, like I oh. do lots of drugs and then it's like those dudes are like, okay. <laughs> well, you know, Sometimes people get upset with one another, and I think the DMT kind of amplifies that. You know, somebody looks at somebody's wife the wrong way, and, you know, the next thing you know, we have a pretty serious beef where, where everybody's threatening one another, uh, and it can get very, very scary very quickly. Uh, and, you know, everybody, a lot of the men are walking around with this green slime kind of dripping out of their nose. Uh, which is indicative of having just had, you know, uh, uh, ingested some of some of the uh, compound. It is used ceremonially and ritually as well uh, for healing purposes, but it's also used uh, in a way that I might describe as somewhat recreational. So it seems like your your state of mind going into a DMT experience is really important because if you're in a bad mood or pissed at someone, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it can amplify things very quickly. Uh, the Yanomami people are often territorial. Uh, you know, they, they cultivate small uh, plots in the jungle. And if people encroach on that or there's a longstanding disagreement about who, what belongs to whom. Uh, but I will say that most of the conflict is over women. Now, with um, in in clinical trials and such, I know it is um, in the recreational settings. Um, kind of stacking substances can be beneficial. Uh, have they started to do that in clinical, adding uh, tagalongs to to some of these? Yeah, you know, I think that um, there. Well, first of all. Uh, there's an organization, a veterans organization called Mission Within. Uh, I believe they work in Mexico uh, that tends to stack ibogaine with uh, with 5 methyoxy DMT, and have seen you know tremendous results in turning around not only issues of PTSD, but also uh, neurological issues associated with traumatic brain injury. I think there may be. Uh, some some incredible value there that needs to be more thoroughly researched. Uh, I think the ibogaine, you know, may not be a necessary antecedent. Uh, you know, it, 
I think it, you know, it's been demonstrated that it has uh, a, a lot of effectiveness for substance abuse issues. Uh, I think in, in many cases, uh, you know, veterans are willing to, to try it. It's, it's a very intense experience if you've never experienced it. It's, you know, about eight hours of really intense experience. And I think, you know, for many of the people who work in the military or have, you know, operated in the special forces, uh, they feel as if, you know, that's unnecessary antecedent to, you know, for them to get the kind of treatment that they need. I think a lot of the benefit, though, comes from the 5-methyoxy DMT. So there, there is some, you know, acknowledged benefit anecdotally to this stacking. Uh, but I also believe that there, as I recall, uh, I don't think, I don't know, ex let me see, who is it? Uh, I, I've heard that there is also a, a trial out there combining uh, LSD with MDMA, uh, you know, just to see wh where that might go. Uh, I actually think that there could be tremendous benefit in, in stacking these things. And it's something we really need to take a look at. Not a lot of research currently, but a bit. This is just a uh, comment on mushrooms. Yeah, Green Table Gardens. He just had a friend that went through um, a ketamine therapy treatment. It said uh, it worked really well for him. So a lot of these things, I think, uh, can can be used to help people like you said, kind of get back to that shamanic presence of it, of using these things, you know, it, you're able to take a step back and be like, they don't fix you. You know what I mean? Let's get that straight. These things, they're not, they're not, they're not just going to snap you, you know, and make you okay. It just kind of shows you, it allows you to take a step back and it allows you to, to see where things are kind of going wrong or, or going the way that they are going and why they're going that way. Um, you know, and then with the benefit of if you do continue to do these in kind of a, a therapeutic way, you're building that neuroplasticity. And if you're going into it with some sort of intent and practices, you know, it's just like going into physical therapy. If you've injured your arm, you're going to go in there and work on that arm and do practices that are going to help strengthen it and make it better. Um, I think we can implement that into our psychedelic experiences as well. You know, I, I think we're at the very beginning of seeing the benefits that psychedelic compounds can provide. You know, uh, we're at the, it, it, just at the start. And uh, obviously, you know, there is something really beneficial therapeutically going on. Uh, you know, with uh, recently John Hopkins, I think, had a 78% uh, success rate with a small study of alcohol use disorder. We have Hus Humphrey Osmond's work in Canada, you know, around the same time as Timothy Leary, showing a tremendous benefit for alcohol use disorder. Uh, I think one of the major areas that we're going to see these things, these compounds show effectiveness is in substance abuse treatment. Uh, it, uh, you know, and, you know, all of these, there's a cluster of mental health indications that are all very interrelated. You know, we tend to see that people with PTSD have substance abuse issues. People with substance abuse issues tend to have PTSD uh, and they tend to be depressed and anxious that this is all kind of an interesting cluster that is, is addressed by these compounds. But I think there may be other areas that are also of interest. You know, I know that uh, there's a trial out right now on anorexia nervosa uh, and uh, compulsive eating disorder uh so you know i think we're just at the very beginning of seeing the benefits that, that psychedelic compounds can provide and years from now we'll look back on this and, and we'll have refined our approach in a lot of different ways uh and and figured out exactly how how to use them effectively in treatment absolutely so we we haven't even talked about what you're currently doing <laughs> You want to bring us up to 2022, yeah, 2023? I've just recently founded uh, Spiritus Biosciences, which is uh, looking at um, sort of the last mile to the patient in terms of both formulation and delivery technology. Uh, a lot of companies out there are looking at novel chemistry 
trying to find new drugs that uh, you know may or may not be as good as the ones we have. Uh, and that really is kind of an artifact of the pharmaceutical uh, enterprise in that uh, a new drug allows you seven years of exclusivity in the marketplace uh, and if you get it through the FDA successfully. So there's a lot of companies out there looking for that new psychedelic that'll offer seven years of exclusivity. And I'm not so sure that, you know, my question is kind of to what end. Uh, it's a really expensive project. Uh, millions and millions of dollars go into it to actually get a new drug to phase three. And I'm taking a different approach. And that different approach is uh, taking some of the compounds that we have, the generic compounds that we have, and finding new ways to contour the experience uh, through formulation and delivery technology. Uh, so in the case of uh, psilocybin, a lot of people experience nausea when they eat mushrooms. 20% uh, of people experience intense nausea. And I believe that the figure may even range higher that people feel slightly uncomfortable. Uh, and that can come to characterize the experience and I think send it in uh, the wrong direction. Uh, and uh, also the onset is somewhat unpredictable. You know, you take mushrooms and, you know, when, when, is, when is the effect going to happen? Is it, you know, going to be half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour? Uh, it, it's hard to tell. Uh, and then thirdly, the experience it lasts about four to six hours, uh, depending upon the individual and the dosage that they take. So uh, what uh, one of the products that uh, Spiritus Biosciences is working on is an oral mucosal metered spray, uh, a sublingual spray of psilocybin that uh, is actually not psilocybin, but psilocin. Uh, we like to use the active metabolite as opposed to uh, psilocybin because a lot of people experience that nausea as a result of dephosphorylation of psilocybin into psilocin. Uh, so we go directly to the active metabolite. A lot of people don't realize that psilocybin is actually the pro-drug and gets converted into the body into psilocin. So we go to psilocin and we deliver it pre-gastrically. That is, we avoid the GI tract entirely uh, and we deliver it sublingually. And we're seeing a much faster onset, uh, around 10 minutes, and a uh, shorter overall duration of the experience, uh, more like three hours as opposed to four to six hours. And we think that's better from a variety of perspectives, one of which is a better utilization of clinical resources uh, you don't have to have a clinician there for as long. Uh, secondarily, uh, it's more accessible to people who may not want to go for a long experience. I'm always trying to see if I can circumscribe the experience in order to make it more available to those people who don't want to be on for a really long time. Uh, and uh, so I believe a lot of this can be achieved through formulation and delivery technology. Uh, some of the other products that we're kind of considering what we're also working on are a rapidly dissolving sublingual tablet that dissolves under the tongue, a small wafer, uh, a buccal film that uh, has a backing on it that prevents diversion down the GI tract and is delivered buccally. Uh, an inhaler medical device that uh, is similar to an asthma type inhaler that aspirates the compound and a transdermal patch, which I'm a particular fan of uh, because it's so patient friendly and so patient tolerable. I think this is particularly of interest with uh, DMT and 5-methyoxy DMT. Uh, a lot of the work that we're doing with psilocybin is very translational to other compounds. Uh, so we, we will be working on other compounds. Uh, one of the other things that's unique about our approach at Spiritus Bioscience is operating in Oregon uh, clinical uh, clinics, uh, essentially as a way uh, to develop data that will further an FDA path. Uh, we see a real opportunity in Oregon 
to be able to do phase three trials in Oregon clinics uh, at uh, one seventh the amount of time and one twentieth the cost of conventional phase three trials. So a much more expedited timeline. We see a lot of value in these emerging state regulated markets uh, like in Oregon and now in Colorado, maybe in the future in Washington, New York, many, many states are looking at it. Texas is looking at it, for example, places you Illinois, would think about. Yeah. Illinois is looking yeah. at it. Uh, so we see uh, an opportunity in these state regulated markets to uh, use them essentially as phase three, phase two clinical trials, collect data, essentially real world data. We haven't actually given psilocybin to more than a couple hundred people in clinical trials. So this gives us an opportunity to look at how these compounds operate in the real world uh, across diverse populations for a variety of different uh, indications and not simply medical indications. You know, Oregon is allowing people, if you want to take psilocybin to get closer to nature, you know, go for it. If you want to take uh, psilocybin for, you know, other more personal reasons, you can. Uh, so we'll be collecting data on all of that. And again, uh, it's essentially two companies, one that is mushroom touching in a state regulated market and one that is uh, houses our IP our provisional patenting, our uh, our data that we collect in Oregon clinics and is pursuing an FDA path entirely. Have, have you, like in the same way that there are, can, there, there's diversity within cannabis genetics, right? Like some plants you grow out are high in CBD, high in CBG, high in THCV, high in certain terpenes versus other terpenes. Can you talk about your exploration of different mushroom strains, psychedelic mushroom strains? And like, as I've always wanted to grow a strain A, have a bunch of people try it for whatever their use case is. Like, I want a microdose for this, or I want a macrodose for that. And then get feedback on like, you know, albino penis envy here's my kind of anecdotal feedback. Now I try, we all tried the next one and the next one and the next one. Uh, so can you kind of talk about exploration of, of the, that, and maybe let people know just how diverse psychedelic mushrooms are. Cause I don't think uh, a lot of people they're know that. They're extremely diverse. Uh, and uh, a number of different, uh, psychoactive compounds are present in both different species and varieties of mushrooms. Uh, even within a species, there are numerous varieties that all express uh, different psychoactive profiles. One, what, what's interesting about it is that the, the mushrooms are extremely adaptive and they get in a particular geographic location and uh, they're isolated, they tend to differentiate quite quickly and produce unique uh, psychoactive profiles. Now, uh, this is where it gets tricky. Uh, we haven't fully demonstrated, uh, we are just beginning to look at an entourage effect in, or an ensemble effect with the psychoactive compounds in mushrooms. Many of the mushroom uh, compounds are what we call quaternary amines and don't cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, individually, oftentimes we'll, we'll give them to mice and look for a head twitch response, which is uh, oh no go indication about whether or not a particular compound has agonism or affinity at the 5-HT2A receptor, which is the receptor that is indicative of the psychedelic response. And uh, a lot of times we'll give some of the other compounds besides psilocin and psilocybin to mice and we don't see a head twitch. So we don't, we're not sure that they're crossing the blood brain barrier and actually having a, uh, a cortical effect. So, uh, but uh, having said that, there is some new data that just came out in 2022 and it's in a graduate thesis uh, that shows a direction we might look to uh, for looking at how the 
uh, entourage effect or ensemble effect might work in mushrooms. And that is a paper where uh, the researcher, I can't remember his name right now, looked at- Do, do, you, do you remember where the researcher is from? Uh, it's, it's uh, let me, you know, I could even look it up real quick. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Actually, uh, a friend of mine on Twitter, a colleague, uh, Andrew Gallimore, I brought it to his attention. He's a neuroscientist. He just wrote a little piece about it uh, that he published on Twitter uh, that's really of interest. Um, but before I say who it is, I'll just say the way what what this researcher found was that when uh, baocysteine, one of the ancillary compounds found in psychedelic mushrooms, is administered with psilocybin, it tends to intensify the effect of psilocybin. Uh, so, and, and Andrew Gallimore recently on Twitter was exploring exactly how does that occur. I had thought maybe it's allosteric mo modulation, but he's suggesting that it, uh, baocysteine may hit one of the other serotonin receptor subtypes, uh, that, uh, not necessarily affecting the 5-HT2A subtype. Uh, so we are just beginning to have data on how the ensemble or entourage effect might work. Now, anecdotally, you ask people, you give them this mushroom or that mushroom, oh, wow, they're totally different. But what's, what's tricky about that is we have a tremendous placebo expectancy effect with psychedelics. If someone's wearing a white coat and they give you a psychedelic, even if it's a placebo, 60% of people will say, yeah, I, I'm having a psychedelic experience. Uh, so we have this tremendous placebo expectancy effect. So when somebody says, here, I'm giving you a different mushroom, you're going to have a different experience. A lot of people tend to have a different experience. And being able to be able to precisely say what in that experience is expectancy and what is actually a different pharmacological effect, we're just beginning to find out. But it does appear that norbeocysteine and baocysteine do intensify the effects of psilocybin. So now <clears throat> I can understand that with uh, Peter. It's a blank screen. We're having problems seeing the image you're trying to present. Uh, um, but now when it comes to like manufacturing these, these compounds and such and how the different chains have different effects, um, how, how far integrated are they into that now? Are they able to, to start? I've heard people talk about you, how you can add a chain here and it's going to, uh, let's say, lengthen the legs, the, the duration of it. Are you able to say, okay, well, I'm going to insert this over here. Um, are you are you able to do that to maybe make something more auditory or, or visual? Do they have that much control yet? Not not yet. You know, we don't have quite that much control yet. We don't quite understand. You know, these are complex interactions uh, at 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 receptors. Really complex. There's there's all sorts of things happening. And, and we're not really at the point where we can actually say for certain, this is explored in an area of, of, of chemistry called structure activity relationships uh, in medicinal chemistry. And we're really not at that point yet. We're beginning to see some very basic ideas, but actually constructing novel compounds uh, that you know, act in a certain way, we're not quite there yet. Uh, like I said, we're just at the point now where we're, we're figuring out, wow, this ancillary compound actually intensifies psilocybin. Uh, you know, there are a number of interesting compounds that occur in mushrooms. Uh, one is baocysteine, which I, I talked about, but then there's also uh, a, a compound called iruganesin. Uh, it was originally discovered by uh, Hokim Gar Gartz in a, a mushroom called inocybe. Iruganesin. Uh, Iruganesin seems to, uh, in his anecdotal experience, provide a, a more euphoric and less dysphoric experience when it's coupled with psilocybin. Uh, he gave it in to a small group of people, and that was the general anecdotal uh, report. But again, we're, we're trying to figure out what's expectancy and placebo and what's an actual effect. Iruganesin, again, is a quaternary amine, and 
doesn't seem, you know, quaternary amines tend not to cross the blood brain barrier except under very unique circumstances. So how it actually influences the experience, we don't quite know yet. Um, another set of compounds that are found in psychedelic mushrooms are harmala alkaloids. This is similar to uh, what's found in Banisteriopsis capi, one of the components of ayahuasca that allows DMT to actually survive hepatic metabolism and not get excreted out by the liver. Uh, DMT normally has no, no oral activity, but when coupled with Banisteriopsis capi and har the harmala alkaloids from it, uh, it has activity, it delays hepatic metabolism. So uh, when we see these kinds of harmala alkaloids in mushrooms, we can speculate that perhaps they make the experience more intense or more long lasting. Uh, you know, all, all of those things are kind of, an, of interest. It, it, we're not certain that they actually occur in amounts sufficient to cause those effects yet. Again, we're still at a pretty early stage of figuring this out. Uh, I, I think something that's kind of instructive here is to kind of imagine how, uh, how mushrooms developed psilocybin as a defense mechanism evolutionarily. Uh, you know, we have examples of this, and this is speculative, but I, I think there's considerable research that might kind of back it up. Uh, insects have serotonin receptors in their throat and GI tract. And the idea here is not necessarily to poison the insect, to keep it from eating the mushroom, but to actually disorient it so that it carries spores and distributes them over a large area. We actually have a, uh, a, 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 a fungus, I think it's Massapenus secadina that infects cicadas and it colonizes them kind of like the last of us type of colonization with cordyceps. It uh, colonizes them and injects psilocybin into their brains. And as they fly around, they distribute spores over a vast area. And that's how the mushroom found a more evolutionarily advantageous uh, compound rather than strictly just a poison that kills the insect. So I think we can speculate that psilocybin maybe have developed along that line. And we have inside the mushroom various ancillary compounds that are on their way to being psilocybin or are you know enzymatically close to psilocybin that developed along these evolutionary pathways uh, really to disorient insects uh, in a variety of ways. Now, as far as relates to ability um, and, and compounds and, and the closeness, isn't DMT and psilocin the kind of closest related, I, would, I guess you could say? As in, yeah, uh, DMT is extremely close to psilocybin. You know, it's it's just like one hydrogen bond different. Okay, wow. Yeah, I heard that the other day, and that kind of blew my mind. Kind of makes yeah. sense, you know. It, it it definitely does. But um... yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, they are very close. Uh, you know, what kind of characterizes these different different tryptamine compounds is the range of receptors that they have affinity for. When we say that uh, a compound has agonism at a receptor, what that really means is, if you can imagine, it's like a switch, it turns it on. When it has affinity or agonism at that receptor, uh, it tends to turn it on or activate it. When it's antagonistic, it tends to turn it off or block it. Uh, so again, these are really complex interactions and uh, Tryptamines tend to activate certain receptor groups. Uh, in the case of uh, psilocybin, uh, you know, the 5-HT series, as well as sigma receptors, all of these govern different, uh, you know, cortical processes, different, you know, immune responses that we have. Uh, and each psychedelic compound kind of addresses a different group of receptors. LSD is unique in that it tends to address a wide, wide range of receptors more than any other compound. 
Uh, tryptamines a, a bit smaller, uh, more uh, in the serotonin receptor area, much smaller, and mescaline uh, and phenol phenolamines, even smaller group of receptors. Uh, we had a, a question. Is there an equivalent to the cannabinoid system for mushrooms and humans? So, you know, how the endocannabinoid system is interkind of related to everything. If, if we affect it, it's going to, I guess, and, you know, affect the rest of us. Is, is there a mushroom and a benoid system? <laughs> there isn't something that's specific <laughs> in the same way uh, that the cannabinoid system uh, exists, but there what mushrooms affect and the tryptamine compounds in them affect is our serotonin system. And the serotonin system governs all kinds of things from perception uh, all the way to uh, our immune system responses. It, it tends to activity at that receptor, it tends to downregulate inflammation uh, in general throughout the body. So it governs our immune system responses. It governs perception and cortical activity, uh, you know, it has a wide range of effects, uh, but that's really kind of the area, you know, mushrooms and psychoactive com uh, psychedelic compounds tend to operate strictly at uh, serotonin uh, type receptors throughout the body, uh, but they also operate at some other receptors, whereas the cannabinoids tend to operate strictly at the cannabinoid receptors. Yeah, I'm seeing right here that um, it is possible that the anti-inflammatory effects of LSD are uh, mediated through endocannabinoids. So that it's it's it doesn't really surprise me too much that everything's so interconnected. You know, you know yeah. One thing uh, not to be overlooked is that we have uh, we have serotonin receptors in our GI tract as well, uh, and. Uh, you know, they are affected. We have actually five HC2A receptors in our serotonin, uh, in our, in our uh, lower GI tract. And what's interesting about that is there is a tremendous relationship between psychiatric disorders and bowel disorders. Uh, you know, there may be treatments where in the future we deliver, uh, you know, some of these psychedelic compounds strictly to the GI tract in order to downregulate inflammation as a treatment for irritable bowel disease as part of a more comprehensive strategy to treat psychiatric disorders. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, my mother, she suffered from Crohn's disease, you know, and that that's a lot of complications due to inflammation down in your, your GI tract and digestive areas and such. So to be able to get a direct application to such area instead of having to bypass the liver and everything else, that's going to be start breaking down and holding back some of these compounds and allow that that, uh, <clears throat> you know, synergization of, of all these compounds together and, and be able to just kind of sit in there and do what it's supposed to do and have those interactions that it needs. For sure. i am uh, been enjoying reading some of this uh, psychedelic science review over here. Yeah, that's a great, a great journal. And it's funny, they're saying, I always kind of, um, for like micro dosing and maybe tiptoeing a little bit past micro, but still in social, being able to go out in social situations. I always did kind of find that uh, LSD was a little bit more pro-social. Um, but that also could be the placebo effect uh, that I just perceived. And <laughs> you know. Absolutely. Well, uh We've been going for uh, almost two hours, and I think we should show some mercy on Dell. For sure. And uh, but Dell, if you'd be willing to come back, I don't think there's anyone who watch it who's watching who would not be very happy about that. So uh, we won't yeah, we won't happy. put you on the I'm spot now, too. but uh, hopefully you'll come back. And, and actually, so it's interesting because. Um, you, you had mentioned Andrew Gallimore, and he's someone who's been on my radar for a while. About I'd love, I'd love to bring him on, and maybe the two of you could chop it up together, which I think would be fun. Yeah, that would be fun. 
Absolutely. So. Yeah, yeah. I uh, look forward to coming back. And, and, and interestingly, when, when you were talking about the smuggling, we may have uh, at 4 o'clock Pacific time. To, it's either going to be today or Friday or next week, but we're trying to get it today. Mike Ritter, who is the author of Tie Stick, is going to come on with a bunch of other guys who are also smuggling uh, a lot of stuff around the world, mostly out of Southeast Asia. So uh, do a little storytelling, but uh, I'll, I'll know in a little bit if we're going to do that. Actually, I could check my email, but uh, if we're going to do that today or punt it to sometime in the future. But uh, Del, my we story, appreciate your time. Yeah, my story gets really more interesting when I – uh, found out that they sold ergotamine tartrate in headache capsules with aspirin over the counter in Mexico. Uh, ergotamine tartrate being one of the main precursors for LSD. So I approached my cartel buddies and said, "Hey, uh, do you think you can find this? It's there's bags of it sitting around at the factory where they make it." And they said, "Oh yeah, we can get that, and we can get anything else you need." And that started a whole other uh, a whole other uh, attempt at manufacturing LSD, which which I can tell you about. And and maybe next time uh, we can get to Bud's question about combo. Absolutely. Which I guess what was that the the dry, dried frog uh, toad skin or something or what what it, what exactly is it? Bufotenine. It's the venom. Uh, oh, that's that's the venom. Okay. Com yeah, we so combo is. Um... Yeah, it's oh, more combo's like, much different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit different, and so um, different frog. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> elemental growth. Uh, she was actually supposed to be on here today to help ask some questions. She wasn't able to make it, but she's going to do like a three-part series on just different substances, and and combo is one of those. She's going to do that one on the seventeenth, uh, Friday the seventeenth. So that'll be exciting for people that are interested in learning about the combo. Very Look forward cool. to it. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank All right, Dell. Enjoy the scenic Mendocino coast. I'm very jealous. And uh, we will talk to you soon. Talk soon. Oh, yeah. Cheers. Bye-bye. Have a great one. That was awesome. That was amazing. I can't wait for uh, part two. I could listen to this yeah. guy forever. Yeah, we were tired. I was like, we haven't even gotten to anything he's doing right now. <laughs> yeah. For real. And not only that, I mean, yeah, there's just so many different avenues you can go down with all the experiences he's had. So I look forward to to what else he has to say. Um, I'm doing a cacao ceremony with Rebecca Paisley today. That's going to be nice. exciting. She uh, got me my my ceremonial cacao. So we will be preparing that. Uh, today at, let's see, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Rock that out. That'll be fun. Never done it. Looking forward to it. And uh, Yeah, do, do you want to give us a quick uh, how, like, why it's used ceremonially? or Yeah, or today gonna... today at 4 o'clock. Uh, you can come she'll, check out all that. She'll, she'll, she'll let us know why that yeah, has yeah. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna historically leave. been used yeah we're gonna really talk about all that today i don't want to the history uh, give, give away too much i want to make you have to tune in <laughs> yeah and i i still want to get um uh we we should bring john schwartz on uh who's now down in columbia living there permanently um because that also reminded me i want to see if he can track down some coca seeds that i can then grow out to make more seeds to give them out to people because this gets back to like, we only think of that plant as cocaine, but in its native environment, people are chewing the leaf, you know, it's like coffee or tea or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think if there's no reason why we shouldn't have access to that here, and I, I'd be psyched to explore just chewing the leaves or making a tea out of it or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I'm excited. Get some some afternoon energy. For sure. So. Um, yeah, we got all sorts of good stuff coming up on this channel lined up. Uh, I'm going to have a microdosing expert come on and talk about, uh, as you were kind of asking, Peter, the differences between 
uh, said cultivars uh, of mushrooms and such and how they can affect differently in said dose dosing and such. So that'll, yeah. be, that'll be fun. Um, yeah. And then tonight we have, uh, let's see, we got green table gardens tonight. We're going to have him and sacred three mushrooms. We're going to have them on. We're going to talk about the progress we've been having in our grow along for, for our mushrooms. Excited about Wait, that. Wait, that's tonight. Yeah. Every my Tuesday. god you got a packed schedule i i got a anyone in la we got our uh weekly tuesday night smoke sesh so yes yes uh packed schedule for sure and then i believe i'm gonna have uh masonic on thursday to talk about his overcoming his problems with drinking and stuff like that and how he's using cannabis and, and said such um i know awesome you know, yeah that'd be that'd be a good thing um, for a community to hear. So yeah, just lots of stuff coming up. Um, excited. Thank you, Patrick. Yes. Uh, Coca. Yeah, no, I just, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't put much effort into getting those specific seeds. I, I actually from, um, I have been looking recently at, uh, chrysanthemum and, uh, what were the other? Have you thought about cactuses? Have you thought about uh, planting? Oh hell yeah! No, I I I uh, I I reached out to Bob Hemphill uh, about getting some cacti. Um, I can I can uh, talk to Sacred Three Tanazi. He's got a whole yeah. team. Yeah. Yeah. No, and and then there's also a guy down here in SoCal who I've wanted to get together with. Uh, I'm just totally blanking on everyone's like Instagram name, but uh, yeah, for sure. he seems like a good dude too. Yeah. So shooter, I saw that post too. <laughs> and I was like, I'm in. Cause I, I guess his he's, which is interesting. He's on a rental property. And I think he said his landlord got skittish about all the, uh, the like forest, the, the forest of cacti that he has uh, going um it's beautiful nice oh that's very cool valerian wormwood i remember wormwood from our uh absent days trying to drink enough to trip and then you just end up passing out because you drank too much alcohol <laughs> yeah that is a good goal oh that is um i know that you and i have discussed just a little bit um kratom i am trying it's rather difficult i'm not lying to find a kratom expert to come in and start talking about kratom uh the benefits and the dangers um especially for people with that are coming off of uh opiates it, it, it's a hard fucking battle man and it's much more difficult when it's not just your mind but your body fighting you as well it, it so Absolutely, brother. Um, I'm trying to find somebody that can try to come on and, and, and talk about that and maybe shed some some light. Yeah, and we, we don't have pride of uh, anybody who's watching. If you know someone, just hit him. Where are you? There, wait. There you are. <laughs> hit him up on uh, IG. Uh because I, I think it kratom also has it can have positive effects but also negative effects is it kind of it, it can yeah it can have a uh a dependency issue so you can okay. build up and then there's a tolerance issue kind of. so yeah you just have to have a regimen and be able to stick to it um and, and if you're going to use it you know what i mean um you know, they're having a they're, they're, I mean, I've read so much back and forth about the benefits of it and the negative effects of it. You know, just from what I've seen in my neighborhood, you know, that stuff is available everywhere. I worked at a uh, neighborhood smoke shop bodega for a while and we sold, you know, we paid rent with just Kratom alone. Um, oh. so. I just realized. So the salves uh, came in. Yeah, see, Turner, Jiddy City nailed it, you know then just go away. Um, my biggest thing was implementing a uh, healthy lifestyle practices and routines. Routines are huge. Uh, finding a good community and it's hard these days, but 
So th this is from... Uh, bu bu bu. Wow. Green table? Also I mean, this. Sacred Garden? Yeah. Cool, cool. Hell yeah. Since he's watching, this came in yesterday. I heard his salves are fantastic. Let me get you up there. Hold up. Oh, can't read it. it says extra strength indica salve apply as needed. Oh, yeah. I love salves, man. I got a bad wrist. It's all janked. Got some weird thing in it. Ganglion cyst. I got to get removed. It's on my nerve. But uh, it smells good. Salves work fantastic. Absolutely love them. Uh, Turgidity City. Hey, Peter, do my free seeds ever show up from Custom Breeds Guy? Was someone sending me seeds to send out to you? I'll go look in the the email reply. Give, give us some time because it's like I, I have don't know him, who... I have him in the calendar or or the sheet. The the dots and eyes are you know they're dotted and crossed. We yeah, we 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 are slowly uh, getting everybody their uh, packs. Yeah, I was able to get out. And then we will do it again that. once uh, we are. <laughs> and we'll be much more prepared and organized this time. If anybody's in the chat right now that is interested in helping out, please uh, reach out. We had Peter. I think yes, we, we could use help. I, I I think the other thing is also if you I, I like conceptually like I get. People who are breeding reach out to me all the time asking if they can like list stuff on Daga. And it's not that I want to be an asshole, but like every time I list stuff, it's like time, effort, data entry, having more, every new vendor kind of exponentially like adds complexity. And so kind of one of the easiest ways if you're, if you're a, like a small up and coming breeder, um, it, it's a medium term kind of brand building play for you to just get your seeds out to people. And I'm happy to do so. People send me seeds. I love giving them out. And then for stuff like that. So this is also if if you watching know some people who are small breeders where, you know, they would want to for the kind of ideally we do a, like a weekly giveaway where we just have fun. Um, um yeah no sacred i i said yeah so I'll, I'll get that out to the person uh to jesse uh and then i'll start uh for the medical program i'll uh i'll because you sent in a bunch um let me put jesse's uh toilet paper over here so i have his address but you also sent uh but yeah, so, so so to finish with it, like if you know some cool small breeders who might want to just get packs out to people and get their name out there and bring happiness to people who, you know, it's like, hey, I just want a pack of free seeds. That's awesome. Uh, let us know because I'd love to just have like 10, 20, uh, 50 packs um Have the Beldia arrived yet? Uh, is there a tracking number on that? Or do you, do you remember when you sent that? Because uh, those would be, yeah, I'd love to get those out. But I, like for just giving, st like there's the medical program, um, which I mean, people like Bodie are sending seed packs in for that. Boneyard, uh, 707 Seed Bank, uh, and kind of other breeders. And then just the giveaway stuff, it's like, if I had 50 packs of something just to get out for fun, it would make these giveaways just a lot easier of all the, because right now it's like, someone's like, I have one pack of something to give out and like, they'll come on. And then it's like, who was that? Who gave that away? What's the YouTube name of the person who won it? Yeah. Uh, well, how, how about this? When did, did you send it out like this past week or a month ago? Um, if it was like in the past week, it hasn't come in yet. Uh, sorry, I was trying to 
Yeah, so here are a bunch of, this is cool, a bunch of little salve. Yeah. We got you froze right now. I'm um, frozen? Yeah. Uh, you know what? Hold on. Sorry. Wi-Fi. Check. Okay, is that better? Nope. No? Still frozen? You're in the philosopher's pose. Hand on okay. deep. Hold on. Let me let me come back. All right. In the meantime. Nah. No, I'm just kidding. What's up, everybody? Cheers. Yeah. Lots of good stuff coming up. Here he comes. Okay, better? Yep. All right. Now this is more from Safer let me, Yard. Let me get you up there. Well, hold on. Let's go. Let's we can almost read it. Sacred Garden. Extra strength. Indica salve. Nice. And then uh, here are some bigger ones. Yeah, so we got different sizes. So anyway, this I'll, I'll just start giving out to people, which is very nice of you. Um, He's a good guy. Oh, it was three awesome. weeks ago that you sent it. Uh, we might have got cut. But that well, was from. He's also from Canada. Yeah, yeah from yeah. So uh, uh, Joe. Uh, yeah. So the other thing is when you do send stuff, the more detail you can put it. Like, send me something that a package is coming. Uh. And then also in the package, let me know like who you are and because I always get random stuff. CBD bear grease. Uh, cool. All right. Well, let's wrap it there. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let everyone know if uh, I hear from Mike. Uh, but we'll go live at four o'clock Pacific time today um seven o'clock my time or we'll punt it to another day but that that should be a fun i i want to get some of these older guys on on a recurring basis to kind of do some history and storytelling and stuff like that i love that so, yeah like Kagu, even get, yeah get like a panel of people so they can start talking about their experiences. no that, that that that's exactly what it is there's this older guy in hawaii uh who's uh hopefully gonna come on with these guys and they can kind of it's like they each have a piece of a puzzle and they can kind of cobble together the like a, a fuller picture of kind of like what was going on in SoCal or you know different right. regions of the world. Absolutely. So all right. I'm gonna Get back to packing orders. <laughs> yeah, I gotta get uh, ready for the busy day podcast today. So, oh, and and then if, if anybody is in Grass Valley for the um, the grassroots event, I just uh, booked my ticket, and uh, I'll be up there. So, let me know. All right. Cheers, everybody. See you later. <laughs>